Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Write America. Happy New Year 2022. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So welcome, and please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. If you missed last month's episode with Juan Felipe Herrera and David Tomas Martinez, or any of the previous episodes of Write America, you can go to Bird's Books Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch. Tonight, Bird's Books hosts a reading by in conversation with Sequoia Nagamatsu, Carla Brundage, and Lance Morrow. I will return after the readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the author. For those of you who may not be familiar with Crowdcast, you probably have noticed the chat off to your right. Feel free to comment freely throughout the evening. But if you have a question, look to the bottom of your screen and you'll see, ask a question. And that's where I will go to look for your questions to ask the authors. Third, there's a call to action button at the bottom of the page that said Birds Books Write America page. Go there and take a look at the schedule or order a book if you like. Now, a little about our first speaker. Sukoya Nagamatsu is a Japanese American writer and managing editor of Psychopomp Magazine, an online quarterly dedicated to innovative prose. Originally from Hawaii in the San Francisco Bay Area, he holds an MFA in creative writing from Southern Illinois University and a BA in anthropology from Grinnell College. His work has appeared in such publications as Conjunctions, The Southern Review, Ziziva, Fairy Tale Review, and Tin House. He is the author of the award-winning short story collection Where We Go When We All Where We Go When All We Were Is Gone and teaches creative writing at St. Olaf College and the Rain and the Rainier Writing Workshop Low Residency MFA program. He currently lives in Minnesota with his wife, the writer Cole Nagamatsu, a cat, a robot dog named Calvino. His latest book, How High We Go in the Dark, will be released later this month and was premiered in Shelf Awareness on December 14th. Please welcome to the screen, Sequoia Nagamatsu. Let me find you. There you go. Right. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. Um, so I'm gonna be reading um, from uh, my forthcoming novel, How High We Go in the Dark. Um, if you don't know um, a lot about it, it's um, a book that uh, takes place um, after 2030 and it follows an intricately linked cast of characters as they um, try to um, navigate and move past an Arctic plague. Um, this is a book that I've been writing for about over 10 years now. Um, so, um, you know, when COVID um, happened, it was certainly, um, there are a lot of prescient things in the novel, um, you know, to say the least. Um, the piece that I'm going to be reading from today uh, is called A Grave Friends. And, um, you know, as I said, the novel follows this cast of characters as they navigate this plague, not only, you know, during the epidemic itself, a pandemic itself, but also um, throughout generations across continents and even in interstellar space. Um, this piece, Grave Friends, occurs um, several generations after the plague has ended, um, and it's also a climate change world. One of the things that I was really interested in um, when I was researching this novel was the, way, the different ways that we grieve and move beyond um, death, how 
a cataclysmic event like a pandemic um, or climate change forces us to reimagine how we live and even how we die. All right, gray friends. On the hypertube ride from Tokyo Narita Airport Island to the archipelago of Niigata City, my sister never once reminded me of how I abandoned our family five years ago. At first, everyone assumed I had simply extended my visit to America. But after one month passed and then another, I finally worked up the courage to send a letter home with a photo of me in a wedding dress on the shore of Lake Michigan. I'm sorry, I wrote. Sorry for making everyone think I had been kidnapped or worse. Sorry I didn't want to live in the same, same sinking town for my entire life or have my ashes stored in a shared urn with the other families on our street, stuck in one place for all eternity. Beside me, Tamami chronicled the lives of my old neighborhood, the Grave Friends, the network of five tight-knit families who agreed two generations ago to mix their ashes together. The shared urn started out as a money and space saving venture, to be sure, when the plague hit and no one knew what to do, what to do with the dead. But our neighborhood found a new appreciation for the shared community after our city became an archipelago amid the rising seas of the great transition of 2070, over 30 years ago now. The Grave Friends Network consisted of five households, although there had at one time been more. The oldest member and the so-called nexus of the neighborhood was my grandmother, my Baba, who used to go from house to house every afternoon to talk stories over cheap wine. There was also my pervy uncle, Michihiro, who often came over to drink and play darts with my father, staring at me in my Sailor Moon style uniform when I was in high school. And the Fujita sisters, who both worked as Gothic Lolita hostesses, donning frilly black Victorian frocks. Mrs. Kishimoto next door had given me koto lessons after school, and Mr. Takata, after he retired from the Mitsubishi solar farm, cared for everybody's gardens in exchange for a modest bounty of herbs and vegetables. Tomorrow, I would pick out Baba's bones from a tray of ash in front of all of these people. And soon after, I'd have to tell my mother that my ashes would never become one with hers and father's, and everyone else we loved. As the tube capsule slowed, drifting beyond rice paddy villages stuck in time, I saw the outskirts of Niigata City, once notable for sake and tulips and a long ago, and a long ago gold rush. The nondescript skyline had become famous for the several dozen funerary skyscrapers dotting a series of tiny islands that served a large percentage of Northern Japan. Dark monolithic towers punctured by clouds and 3D billboards reminding the city that we'll all die one day and we should take advantage of their mortuary package specials. But beneath their shadows, I could see the old city, the aging utilitarian apartment buildings nestled beside secondhand shops, love hotels crowned with gaudy neon signs. Next to my old high school was a large stone Toria gate now half submerged in water, carved with the names of those who died during the plague, a former place of picnics and reunions before the waves crept slowly past the park. Beyond the train station, self-driving company cars idled in a roundabout before zipping through the familiar arteries of Bandai District, the labyrinth of bars and mom and pop shops that hadn't changed in decades, the cracked streets of, of, of the past merge onto the floating bridges connecting the city like a cobweb. Peeking out from the water, the Rainbow Tower, a refurbished remnant of an old shopping complex that became an underwater hotel. As a child, I used to watch fireworks from the tower's spinning observation elevator, marveling at the silhouettes of the drowned shopping mall with each explosion. Students and grannies on bikes still clogged sidewalks, riding beside 30 high, 30 foot high seawalls and across neighborhood bridges. I didn't want my want to, I didn't want to only remember the good times, but I had a sudden hankering for pizza with mayonnaise, a shrimp burger from McDonald's, a bowl of udon with vegetable tempura to slurp alongside grumpy salarymen. I wanted to call my old friends from school, maybe sing our hearts out in some karaoke booth. 
this was my drowned world. Of course, I knew none of this would happen right away. So I began. I wanted to know if my parents were going to play pretend like my sister, if by the grace of Baba's death, I had somehow been granted probation by my mother and would be reinstated into the family without a lecture. What's going on with mom and dad these days? You mean, are they going to rip your head off? Tamami was this easy sibling, a kind of doormat, the sort of person who went along with the wishes of others and didn't complain, but she was no idiot. Uh, yeah. Dad is just happy to see you. Mom, on the other hand, I'm not so sure. She asked about your flight. Basically a 50-50 shot of being murdered or tied to a chair. There are too many people come in going, paying their respects to Baba. He's not going to make a scene. Of course, Tamami never received the brunt of our mother's wrath, but the time my mother found me making out with the bad boy, Kosuke, outside a nearby corner store and dragged me home so hard I had bruises on my arm for a week. Or the time she found my report card and didn't talk to me for a month because she said I was hopeless. I was going nowhere. But where would I go? And where would she want me to go that wouldn't be considered abandoning home and her sixth sense of loyalty to the Grave Friends Network? The next town over, the one after that? By the time I turned 18, the lure of the big city no longer existed. Even Tokyo and Osaka had become a muted collection of islands with barely any room for new residents. This is where you belong. This is where our family has always been. Everything you need in life is here with us. This street is a shining example of how people should be in Japan. We're not a cult, I try to explain to friends in America. Not really. And I'll stop right there for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me... Uh... Our next speaker, Carla Brundage, is a Bay Area-based poet, activist, educator with a passion for social justice. Carla is the founder of West Oakland to West Africa Poetry Exchange, which has facilitated cross-cultural exchange between Oakland and West African poets. Carla is a board member of the Before Columbus Foundation, her editorial experience includes Pan-Africanist WO2WA Poetry Collection, Our Spirits Carry Our Voices, Oakland Out Loud, and Words Upon Waters. Her poetry book, Swallowing Watermelons, was published by Ishmael Reed Publishing Company in 2006. Her poetry, short stories, and essays have been widely anthologized and can be found in Hip Mama, Literary Kitchen, Lotus Press, Bamboo Ridge Press, Vibe, and Conk Magazine, Literary Magazine. She holds an MA in education from San Francisco State University and an MFA from Mills College. Her latest book, Mulata Not So Tragic, is published by Fleur du Mal Press. Please welcome to the screen, Carla Brundage. Let me find you here, Carla. There we go. Thank you, Alice. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Um, and. I will be reading some poems tonight, sharing some poems with you. And I've been thinking a lot about this series and specifically about what it means to be a single black cis woman in this time in history. And so I wrote a series of poems called uh, Single Black Woman Syndrome, kind of inspired by the work of Joy DeGruy. And I'm gonna be reading mostly from that collection. Um, so I'll just start this one, um, it's called braiding, braiding like hair. She brushes a memory, each one, a thread, a synapse pulling causes a snap. Even one strand holds all her DNA at its bloody end. Curls curl around each other for protection their strength in the hold of the braid, pulling them out would leave her vulnerable. She resists the comb, embraces the tang tangle of memories, nonsensical reactions to past pains, scars, and scar tissue. There's no parting or straightening, bleaching or pressing. Here she is only whole with these moments kept in her head as memories. 
Is black girl hair a burden? Straightened, permed, nat be natural. Is black girl hair an act of defiance, always resistance against something? I hear them talk about me. It's always the hair grasping it in their white hands. Don't recognize me without hair. If I'm beautiful with this hair, then I want to be ugly. Without my hair, suddenly you see me. I had to cut it off, I say. Believe me, sister, I know, comes the nod. Um, these poems are sort of based, um, this next couple poems is kind of based on looking at the etymology of the word mulatto um, and looking at my family history a little bit. Quadroon, noun, 1707, offspring of a white and a mulatto from Spanish quatron, chiefly used at the offspring of European and mestizo, literally one who has one fourth Negro blood from Quato fourth in Latin. This can be explained as having one Negro grandparent or two grandparents who were octoroons, but who is counting? America is counting. Counting slaves, counting bodies, counting profit, counting drops, and one drop counts. One drop of African blood makes you legally a Negro in 1707 constitutes three-fourths a man. Tragic. Fragments of bloodlines. She walks the quad before sun rises. Flashes of memory, shoulders squeezed between angry thumbs. She desired to be held, but not held down. Muffled scream, a bang on the door, lock in. Now she weaves her way home, hair matted in semen, cold prickles shiver her bare thighs, night's sequined dress a drape. Quadroon, passive. Latin, Spanish, Spanish, French, Negro offspring, white and mulatto, one quarter Negro blood, still a slave, but maybe in the house. Octoroon, definition in progress. Grandpa is a black Indian, his parents not slaves. Black Indians, one half Native American and one half black. So if grandpa's parents were Powhatan and black, grandma is building back the black blood. You are mulatto, then you marry black. Then your children are three quarters but now the word is African-American, and then maybe they marry out. Division causes erasure, lines in my math, gray smudge and ivory parchment, my theory no longer a proof. So uh, my father is white and my mother is black. And um, our history is kind of intertwined, well, their history is intertwined. Um, my mother's first cousin was killed in the civil rights movement. Um, and I wrote this poem about that experience, Sammy Young Jr. It's called Alabama Dirt. Never tasted Alabama soil, flown clay. It's the dust I'm made of. Sweet tomatoes, Uncle Sam bowed under the sun, gently handles the small fruit. So few men in my family line live. Family secrets buried in denials. Sammy lies in a pool of my mind, golf club in his hand of blood. I call my mom on the phone to ask about vigilante justice in the segregated South. We don't talk about that. But was there justice, I ask? Time follows no rules and gunshots still deafen. As a child, I was obsessed with a black and white photo. I'd hide in the corner and go over it in my mind. 
lay in the bed with Sammy Young Jr. dreaming him to smile? What made him decide to fight this battle alone at night in Macon County after participating always as part of a team? You had emotional problems, mother says. Back then, I just did not want to talk about it. All the things she does not want to talk about. My emotional problems, she calls them. Images of blood still pooling on black cement, imagined weaponed, justification for death. What was in his beautiful head that they found the bullet college educated brains shot out from being hot headed or uppity ripples of this one death penetrate generations and here i am still swallowing pills i'm gonna end um with a poem for my dad it's a real shift in pace um i grew up in hawaii um and so my father recently passed away, but I had the privilege of taking care of him before he passed. And this is um, a story. It's called Over Pahoy Hoy, which is smooth lava. Our girl's back, trees whisper, as they watch her toting suitcase over Pahoy Hoy lava driveway. Father, once a pillar, now faces ashes of former life, a daughter returning, she stormy as Hiiaka, he fiery like Pele, they fire and water don't mix, but this time he is weak, simmering, she is raging, hurricane of healing, she bangs the cabinets clean with Clorox, brushes out bugs, rodents, cane spiders, sweeps the soot from the chimney, she brings her woman's touch to vast fields of nowhere where he lives. Our daughter's back, now a woman. Her touch is rough, not gentle. Her voice commands respect. She towers over him, threatening him into submission. Father, she says, you are the child now. Take your medication like I said. Stop living like this. Take care of yourself. I love you. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Our next speaker is Lance Morrow. Lance Morrow is an author and journalist whose essays appeared for many years in Time Magazine, where he wrote over 150 stories, eight Man of the Year profiles, and hundreds of essays covering wars from Vietnam to the Middle East and Bosnia. The American presidency from Nixon to Obama and the radical changes in American life in the second half of the 20th century into the 21st. He is the author of eight books, including the widely acclaimed memoir, The Chief. Selections of his essays have been, have been published in Fishing in the Tiber and in Second Draft of History. He is a winner of the National Magazine Award in Essay and Criticism. Morrow is currently the Grand Groom. Morrow is currently the Henry Grunwald Senior Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington. Please welcome to the screen, Lance Morrow. Let me find you here, Lance. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Alice. Um, I wanted to um, start by reading uh, an historical piece that uh, takes us back um, to 1968, uh, to the Chicago Convention. It, it, in look at it, looking at it this afternoon, it occurred to me that um, some of the passages in this description of what happened uh, there in Chicago in '68 uh, have a uh, ca cast some light on uh, the divisions in the country now. Um, so, I will begin. Uh, outside the Hilton, at the corner of Michigan Avenue and Balbo Drive, I stood talking to Winston Spencer Churchill. Churchill was kicking around the world as a newspaper correspondent. I noticed he liked to watch the reaction when he stuck out his hand and said, Hello, I'm Winston Churchill. 
for he resembled his grandfather's pictures taken when that young Winston covered the Boer War at the turn of the century, boyish and freckled, greedy for trouble. Now, behind the police lines, Churchill and I chatted with a guilty voyeur's air, as if waiting, awaiting some illegal sporting event, a cockfight or a sloppily organized human sacrifice. It was early evening on Wednesday, just after seven. Even on the lakefront, the air stank. The tear gas dispensed by one side and the stink bomb set off by the other lingered in mouth and throat. Across the scene, phalanxes of blue helmeted cops, battle jeeps with barbed wire like mustaches across their grills, the guerrilla idealist young in tantrum, their faces contorted with rage. There swept not only rhythmic waves of sound, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? But, a, but an amazing satanic smell, a yippie genius's brew that simulated vomit, decomposing flesh, death, cloaca, and kindred flavors. It was what evil would smell like if it were available in an aerosol can. Bad enough to make the south side stockyards next door to the convention smell almost wholesome. This exotic moral stink had drifted halfway around the world, after all, from Vietnam. In front of the Hilton on Michigan Avenue, two sides of America ground against each other like tectonic plates. Each side cartooned and ridiculed the other so brutally that by now the two seemed to belong almost to different species. The 1960s had a genius for excess and caricature. On one side, the love it or leave it proud, middle American, oaky from Fanoki, traditionalist union of squares, nation of squares, who supported the Cold War assumptions that took Lyndon Johnson ever deeper into Vietnam. On the other side, the countercultural young, either flower children or revolutionaries, and their fellow traveling adult allies in the anti war movement. The Eugene McCarthy uprising against LBJ, people whose hatred of the war in Vietnam led them into ever greater alienation from American society and its figures of authority. Mayor Richard Daly's frontline forces in Chicago must have been chosen for immovable heft, men built like trucks. Now they silently palm smacked their clubs, their eyes as narrow as the slits in an armored car. Most of the convention delegates and dignitaries quartered in the fortress Hilton were at the moment three miles away at the convention hall, preparing to bestow upon poor Hubert Humphrey the nomination he thought would redeem the years of humiliation and corrupting self-abasement that he had endured as Johnson's vice president. The police needed to protect the Hilton nonetheless. It housed not only delegates and candidates, but also the country's besieged political process, its apparently crumbling legitimacy. Recollect the famous sequence at the front end of 1968, that bizarre and violent year. One, the war that America was fighting for inaccessible reasons in an obscure little Southeast Asian country seemed to blow up in America's face with the communist Tet Offensive in late January. Number two, Minnesota's Democratic Senator Eugene McCarthy challenged the president Lyndon Johnson in the New Hampshire primary and won 42.4 percent of the Democratic vote. Seeing that, Robert Kennedy hurried into the race. Number three, LBJ withdrew as a candidate for election, re-election. Number four, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, a murder that precipitated days of riots in cities across the country. Number five, Robert Kennedy was killed in Los Angeles in early June, and so on. 
It is part of the folklore, each act more amazing than the one before, a dark jack-in-the-box of history. On Tuesday night of the Democratic Convention week, the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia and eradicated the Prague Spring. Now there was silence on the cops' side of the barricades, an ominous hurricane stillness. On the other side, the dirty, skinny, red-eyed, hyper unslept screaming anti-war young their youthful energy converted to electrical fury rage shot out of them like sparks like flaming snakes no flowers in their hair now the foresighted among them wore football helmets then the cops charged they moved with surprising speed and a nimble fury like that of a rhinoceros attacking, a flying wedge of blue drove down Balbo into the noisy, ragged flesh on Michigan. The cops bent to their work, avengers at harvest time, chop-swinging clubs with methodical ferocity, a burst-boil rage. And in the midst of it, I began to detect a certain professional satisfaction of the kind a hitter feels sometimes. The cops had found a ghastly sweet spot, the sound that a club makes when it strikes a human skull, in earnest, awakens in the hearer a sickened, fearful amazement. No kidding now, a thunk, resonant through the skull and its wet package of thought and immortal soul. It dawned on me that I was now an animal as much in season as the protesters, for the blue rhino was wheeling back, flailing through the bloodied crowd. I skittered into the Hilton lobby. A cop lumbered after me with club upraised and aimed at my skull just above the left ear. I held up my press credentials like a ridiculous little magic shield like a clove of garlic or the sign of the cross, and the cop went into freeze frame and thought about the matter long and hard before at last he lowered his club, a flicker of disappointment in his eye, and moved on to hunt for other game deeper in the lobby. The cops outside went on banging heads almost indiscriminately. Middle-aged bystanders were as likely to be bloodied as young radicals. People were dragged feet first, heads bouncing on pavement to paddy wagons and hurled in. The demonstrators knew their McLuhan and chanted, the whole world is watching. After a delay caused by strikes that prevented live transmission, the television networks finally broadcast the footage of what a national commission would later call a police riot. Uncle Walter Cronkite was visibly furious Tom Wicker would write in the New York Times, those are, were our children in the streets and the Chicago police beat them up. The bashing on Michigan Avenue was only one of a series that week. In the last, just before dawn on Friday after the convention adjourned, the police permitted themselves to go berserk in the halls of the Hilton, rousting sleeping McCarthy workers from their rooms and beating on their skulls. Police claimed the workers had been throwing things, beer cans, ashtrays, bags of excrement, down on cops from the windows above. The 1968 Democratic Convention was part of the er mess of the 1960s, and in a sense, the big bang of the American culture wars. And here we are now. I should, I should mention that I wrote this, this piece in um, uh, 1996. Uh, on the eve of the Chicago, the uh, the Democrats having a new Chicago convention with renominated uh, Bill Clinton, um, more or less the same two tectonic plates are still grinding each other against each other in America. Their surfaces may be a little smoother now. <clears throat> Before Johnson fell for the tar baby of Vietnam, Americans believed their presidents almost always told them the truth. The level of trust and therefore respect for authority was probably foolishly high. All of that changed in the fatal asininity of Vietnam. The baby boomers' rites of passage turned into a huge Oedipal overtoppling of authority, an assault on dad 
that was disorientingly successful. It takes years for all the myth and trauma to work through the system. Maybe they have done so only this summer of 1996, after 28 years have passed, and the Democrats feel free as adults now, leaders of the party, to return to the old slaughterhouse. Well, <laughs> 1996 is uh, is what, uh, 25, 26 years ago, and uh, what I said about that is still, unfortunately, even more intensely accurate. I wanted to um, do something quite different, as because that was, um, and and and, and right with end with a piece of fluff. Um, I should explain, this is called Mars as a Divine Cartoon. Uh, I, I guess everybody knows who Chuck Jones was. Chuck Jones was that, the wonderful, the great uh, animator and cartoonist who, who did um, Bugs Bunny and, and uh, uh, the Coyote and Roadrunner and Elmer Fudd and Daffy Duck and so on. He, I got to know him in the 90s. And um, I was a great admirer of his. Um, in in 1996, again, a uh, a meteorite from apparently from Mars struck the Antarctic, and there was a big fuss about it, and, and as proof of life on Mars. So <clears throat> I did this this piece uh, about Chuck Jones and the, so on. Um, the great American metaphysician Chuck Jones discerned some years ago that the universe operates in sequences of violent Newtonian reciprocities. Jones dramatized his idea in the famous Wiley e. Coyote Roadrunner sequence. Coyote sets in motion giant boulder A, which whistlingly descends into a canyon to strike seesaw lever B, catapulting giant boulder C into orbit, and so on. Jones's work is a bridge that carries Isaac Newton across into chaos theory. And now Jones is vindicated. We see that some 16 million years ago, the slapstick asteroid A slammed into planet B, that is Mars, the fourth rock from the sun, <clears throat> dislodging spud-sized meteorite C, which spitballed through space and whammed into planet D, the Earth. Betimes, the alien microspud wakes up in the Antarctic and assumes the shape of an out outlandishly hot idea, E, there is life on Mars. <clears throat> which pinballs hectically through earthling media, knocking vases off the mantelpiece, toppling assumptions, causing tabloid amazement and theological consternation. <clears throat> More vindication. Jones anticipated last week's news by suggesting long ago that life on Mars takes the form of a supercilious ass who wants to disintegrate Earth with his Illudium Pew 36 explosive space modulator because Earth obstructs his view of Venus. Earthkind's hero, Bugs Bunny, snuffs out Marvin the, the Martian's modulator fuse and saves the world, a feat that theologians agree must rank slightly ahead of Daffy Duck's space, space exploration in quest of Illudium Fosdeck's The Shaving Cream Atom. The mind resists reducing cosmogony to cartoons. On the other hand, what could be more in the spirit of Coyote and Roadrunner than the Big Bang? Science instructs us that the universe is made of beer suds or of string. Time bends like a pretzel and vanishes into a black hole. What if the universe is actually hysterically funny, the work of a trickster comic? When humans confront the unknown, they may at one extreme resort to humor or at the other extreme to theology. 
Both impulses, one discipline, the other not, are forms of speculation, and both may be in different ways profound. Anarchic humor tends to inherit the universe when theology falls apart. The humor is either a refreshing relief or a prelude to despair. The wandering piece of Mars reminds everyone of cartoons and fantasies that the red planet has always stimulated. Among other things, it has brought radio talk shows alive with the voices of vindicated UFO spotters, the Mars rock being their Rosetta Stone, the key that unlocks the mystery. But does the rock threaten the centuries-old assumptions and designs of theology? Most of the world's faiths are content to enlarge the franchise and embrace the possibility. If life exists on Mars or anywhere else in the universe, God put it there. In my father's house are many mansions. Humankind has been living in one small room. Interesting questions do arise among Christians. For example, if life exists on other world, is, worlds, is it intelligent life? Mars's fugitive microbial traces are a long, long way from the ensoulment that distinguishes humankind. If creatures on other planets have souls, are they fallen in the Christian sense? Or are they unfallen, an unfallen, sinless race? If fallen, does the earthly incarnation and sacrifice of Christ redeem all extraterrestrials as well, or will, must, Christ redeem each planet's souls separately by taking an incarnation in their form? C.S. Lewis worried about these questions years ago and quoted uh, poet Alice Maynell's Christ in the Universe. In the eternities, doubtless, we shall compare together here a million, a million alien gospels in what God guise he trod the, the Pleiades, the lyre, the bear. The possibility that life exists elsewhere is, of course, a blow to the incorrigible human sense of self-importance. People accustomed to thinking of themselves as significant, masters of the universe to whom God made all else in creation subsidiary, might be demoted to distant cousins tenant farming on their speck of dust. Sentimentalists have clung to the thought that life gives meaning to a barren, indifferent universe. What if life, surprise, turns out to be a miracle almost infinitely replicated across the universe? Is its meaning thereby infinitely augmented, or is it instead reduced to a commonplace as the miracle of human flight became ordinary? The moment, of course, is far off. As early as the 18th century, British scholar Richard Bentley <clears throat> pursued the argument that God's omnipotence and glory might require many planets, <clears throat> many arenas for their display. Comedy might reconcile with theology along the same line of thought by suggesting that perhaps God is a performance who created intelligent life because he needs an audience. Good evening, ladies and germs begins the voice across the deep. I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. And with that fluff, I will, I will finish. Ah. Alice, are you there? I don't come on at this time. This is where you all chatted uh, up. Ah. Uh, well, if I could say, uh, mention something to Carla. I mean, I'm, um, uh, I'm, I'm old enough to when I was a young man. Um, I, I covered the the early civil rights movement and so on, and. Um, uh, in the sixties, and I, I found your Alabama poem very powerful, and uh, uh, I thought it was terrific, and uh, it it brought back 
a lot of the I, I remember those days vividly and I remember the um yeah I mean those the the the, the people down there were were uh, great heroes and and they uh I remember I covered Lemuel Penn a, guy, a Washington educator who was killed down there in the course of uh, the 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 Selma Montgomery time you know and all that but anyway I I did I did admire your poem very much and I thought it was uh, very evocative thanks I think um it's been such a wonderful reading but that brings up to the question I had for you I guess because I was like basically born around that time when that when it actually happened I was born in 1967 and I'm wondering like when I in from your first piece um you were talking the Winston Churchill piece you were talking about 1968 and I'm I'm wondering how it feels probably both you know how it feels then versus now like well it's you know there there, there are certain similarities in the intensity of the divisions and as as you could you could tell from that piece that that uh, uh but of course the you know it's a different country and it's and a lot has happened and there's been an evolution um in the country so so it's in then it was then it um mostly coalesced around vietnam about the anti-war business there was the there were of course the concurrent disturbances in many and you know the god knows in when when uh, Martin, dr king was was killed uh there were uh, massive uprisings all all over the country and cities all over the country and so race was very much a part of it but uh, it coalesced around vietnam uh i've often talked to people about are the were the divisions worse then than they are now uh they were certainly very very intense and very uh there was a great deal of violence there was uh uh you know the there were bombings and and uh the all of that uh it's it's not a very good answer but this is the same but different i mean there was a there was a i mean how does it seem to you i, I don't know uh i i don't quite I, the 60s i know backwards and forwards and i i sort of understood the 60s i the, the present time i don't feel that i really understand i mean i don't um, i don't grasp it because i'm a different generation and, and so on but uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I I wonder what you guys, how you would look at it. I mean, I, I teach. Uh, um, I, I have a history of environmental activism, and you know, I was looking at Carla's history as well. And I'm also just interested, in Carla, as well, because uh, you grew up in both Hawaii and California, and I also have that past. And you know, I think before we started the reading, somebody kind of mentioned, you know, what play, what the importance of place might have you know might play in all of us maybe place and time because we're, we're such different writers um but you know kind of back to my point i i've been teaching this climate fiction this climate change course for several years now and i've seen this marked shift in my students just even over the past five years or so um where students have been seeing um kind of the issue of climate change and other social injustices as we need to stop this right now. And that narrative has actually changed. I'm sorry, years. Sequoia, as they've seen it as what? I, I missed the last they, they, they have been seeing it as this imperative um, topic that they want to stop. We need to stop climate change. We need to stop social yeah. injustice. Yeah. And that narrative has shifted among um, the generation of my students, I guess Gen Z um where they have recognized that we've reached a tipping point in some ways that okay with regards to climate change there are certain things that we can't come back from and we need to think about how can we stop uh further damage how can we address and change the language change the vocabularies 
that we're using to talk about these issues because how we're talking about these issues now and engaging with them isn't working. And so there's this, I think, acknowledgement of, I think, especially younger people that um, there needs to be a system change and that there also needs to be an adaptation to life that is going to be uh, very, very different from what we recognize now. Um, and I think that's very different from activism um, and movements from the past, where um, I think a lot of younger people now are, are seeing it not only as um, an issue, a, a movement of, of solidarity, but also a movement of acknowledging that we need different tools. Yeah, wow. I love that answer because definitely, Sequoia, in, in your reading, your your description of place was so fascinating. And I was like, is it Hawaii? Is it the Bay Area? Is it the future? I could, and your descriptions are so beautiful. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And wanted to hear more about, about that. I heard the word talk story. <laughs> I wanted to hear more how, about how you created your future. Um, I mean, I, I lived in Japan for a couple of years, and as I said, I, I, I also, you know, have um, I lived in Hawaii for until I was twelve, so I have kind of that island background. But um, climate change was kind of omnipresent um, in my mind as I was writing this future, and then that chapter took place, um, you know, several generations from now, and so I was looking at sea rise projection levels you know, worst case scenario, and actually not even worst case scenario. Um, you know, if we did some things right within the next few years, what would the coastlines look like? Um, and, you know, for a country like Japan, um, you know, a lot of the cities would be in danger um, in terms of, you know, their cities being flooded by, by, by the ocean. And so I was thinking about what would that do um, to communities? Um, specifically, my novel was less interested in um, kind of societal reactions. There's certainly some of that. I talk a little bit about the financial system and how the funerary, the funerary industry is reacting to something like the plague and in a very sort of capitalist way. Um, but I was very, very focused on family units and the individuals. So what would a neighborhood, what would a family do? How would that um, how would their memory persist over generations? How would their stories evolve over generations? And so we have the story of a grandmother, a great grandmother helping um, their neighbors, um, these climate refugees um, move to the mainland, to the new mainland. Um, how would this great grandmother be insistent that she remain in her house even though the flood waters are coming? And so I think those, for me, that was, those were the stories that were important for me to tell, because I, th I feel like we, all, we always get kind of this sensational societal government reaction. We have that story already, but um, we, what we don't get very often in fiction is, um, or in film, is the focus on the individual unit. Did you, uh, Sequoia, did you do, or do you do a great deal of scientific research and so mm -hmm. on in order to? How yes. do you go? How do you go about that? Um, well, reading a lo lot of reading. Um, sometimes just emailing scientists themselves. Um, a lot of web research. Um, I spent a lot of time in virtual reality for for some of my my chapters mm -hmm. as well. Um, so there's a chapter that takes place on an interstellar starship, and I was like, okay, so what are the theoretical forms of propulsion that are possible maybe within the next, you know, few generations. You know, let's say we if we had some kind of, you know, otherworldly help, like what is physically, what is possible within the realm of physics? And so I, I decided to kind of, you know, think about those um, issues. Um, that ship stops in different planets. What are planets right now that we know of that might be habitable? Right. Is or, it possible is it possible to maintain um, your concentration on character and you know that the, the, the usual uh, fiction writers preoccupation with character development and all that when you're taking these characters out of 
the normal human context and putting them under uh, these stresses of, of uh, novel uh, apocalyptic circumstances and so on. How do you manage that as a writer? Sure. I mean, I guess, well, um, first off, I, I will say that I do all my research way ahead of time because um, I don't want that to be omnipresent in my mind when I'm actually writing and thinking about characters and relationships. Yeah. So I want the research to be organic. It's part of me by the time I'm actually writing the novel. Right, right. Um, as far as kind of, you know, any kind of apocalyptic or dystopian or science fictional um, elements, you know, how do I maintain the humanity of those characters? Yeah, um, that's what I mean. You know, I, I think, you know, what my, my, my core, I think this is probably true for anything that I write, is that my the core question that I want, I want to answer is like, how would um, a human being, and maybe specifically, maybe how would a father and a single father and a son, let's say, react to um, the loss of a mother in this devastating pandemic? And this is something that obviously we're living in COVID now. And so what might have seemed like science fiction or very fantastical, um, you know, even a couple of years ago, doesn't seem as fantastical now. Um, so I really wanted to kind of think about, you know, how fantasy and science fiction are actually just lenses to look at how humans behave under different stressors, right? right? So it could be, you know, um, uh, it could be a monster, it could be um, uh, a generation of starship, it could be a plague, whatever it may be, I'm not, I'm never forgetting about the humanity. I would say that humanity is central to my enterprise. Um, yeah, I'm just yeah. thinking about, you know, how this other, you know, larger than life element is upsetting the everyday. And by upsetting the everyday um, life of a character, that character is able to maybe reflect a little bit more about what life was for them, you know? Yeah. And I think that's something that we can all relate to right now in that pandemic. Yeah. You know, when we're under, when we're under lockdown, Absolutely. you know, yeah. we are yeah. taken outside, kind of using an anthropological term, we're taken to yeah. a liminal space, you know, yeah. an outside space where we're able to think about, well, did we live, what was our life like? Do we yeah. really want to go back to that, you know, yeah. completely? Is, yeah. is that normality something that we want to return to, right. or do we want to reimagine a better future for ourselves? Mm -hmm. That's that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful conversation, you all. I hate to say it, but I have a couple of my own because I am a bookstore, so I need to ask some book questions. A first question that I want to ask is: Do you know of any emerging t uh, authors right now? <coughs> that we might not have heard of that you'd like to share with us for broadening our knowledge of, of you know, their work. No? No, come on. Academics, you have to know some people. Okay. Well, I, um, that's all right. It's not homework. <laughs> oh, no, no. I do. I do. I do. <laughs> okay, Carla, I knew I could count on you. <laughs> I feel mm -hmm. like there's so many people in my community, um, beautiful writers such as Awanda Sabir, who doesn't have a book yet, but who's coming out with a book, um, activist and writer in Oakland, and Allison Francis, who's I co-authored my last book with, um, Mulata Not So Tragic. Allison Francis is an amazing poet and scholar. She's at Chaminade University. Um, yeah, there's so many people in my community that I could shout out to. So that was my hesitation. I was like, oh, so many people. <laughs> Can I send you a list? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I just feel irresponsible not bringing up any potential newbies that I would ha like to have on the radar for the, the sake of everyone watching tonight. The other thing, and I cannot resist. Oh, go ahead. This oh, one, Gaia Deli and Zinga, she's our um, Oakland first Oakland public poet laureate, and this is her book, Sorrowland Oracle. Awesome. Wonderful. And I just yeah. put a couple of suggestions in the yes. chat. Uh, one is Reprieve by uh, James Hahn Matson that came out uh, this past fall, 
and it's um, I would describe it as um, a literary horror. Um, but and but don't if you if you're afraid of horror, if you, if you don't like scary things, I, I wouldn't let that put you off because the novel takes place um, partly in a full contact haunted house where a murder happens. Um, but the novel is sort of like jumps between this uh, this thread in the haunted house and um, looking into the lives of everybody that was complicit in some way in the murder. And it's a, wonder, it's a wonderfully layered and textured novel that is about race, it's about um, sexuality, um, it's about toxic, toxic masculinity. Um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful novel um, and I'm actually teaching it um, in the spring, which is, you know, just goes to show like how much I liked it. Uh, the second novel um, that I have on my list, I haven't read it yet, but I love the writer. Um, is Allegra Hyde's um, e Eleutheria. And um, it's, she's the author of a former collection called um, Of This New World. And this novel is focusing on um, climate change and climate activism. And the uh, main character is um, this very hopeful um, sort of activist that discovers this, uh, this book that leads her to an island commune. And there is this mystery that is sort of happening there um, among the, these sort of eco warriors that she sort of has to discover what their real intent is. So those are my Well, two. I want to remind the audience too that the chat stays here. So if you come back to watch the episode again because you forgot something, the chat will still be here. So you can come back and find those resources at any time. And I have to ask the last question. What is it you're reading right now? Well, I'm I'm writing a book about the 20th century. So You're writing I'm, one, but what are you reading one? Uh, well, I know, but I'm I'm Sorry. about to tell you that I, I'm uh, so uh, the the um, books that I'm reading have to do with with the 20th century and with uh, with 20th century history and so on. And uh, I'm afraid that for uh, escapism and uh, and I'm listening to. Uh, to trollop a great deal because I find trollop the most uh, it takes me away every time I did the trollop is a wonderful wonderful novelist and and for for sheer pleasure and getting away uh, I think trollop trollop is uh, is just wonderful so I'm I'm uh, I've just been going back through the Barchester novels and uh, wonderful Sequoia I them. saw that you uh, put ninth medal Mm -hmm. Yeah, by so ben Ninth Percy. Metal by Ben Percy. So, um, you know, you may have read a Ben Percy novel before. He's a very prolific and uh, very sort of genre pushing novelist. Um, he's like written everything from realist fiction and, and, and westerns to werewolf novels to, to this. He also writes for Wolverine for, Mar for Marvel. Um, so, The Ninth Metal, uh, in a nutshell, is about this comet that lands on Earth, and there's this sudden boom in, in uh, this, this metal that they're, that they're able to mine. So it kind of sur surrounds this um, uh, incident of this, this comet landing and this um, boom town around, around this new metal that has, uh, I won't spoil it, has special properties. And it's part of a trilogy called The Comet Cycle. And I think the new one is coming out uh, tomorrow, actually. And Carl, um, you know. I'm reading, if to be real super honest, I'm reading for work. So I'm reading the, the anti-racist writing workshop, How to Decolonize the Creative Classroom by Felicia Rose Chavez. Um, and we're There's... talking about anti-racist literature in our, I work at 826 Valencia, so in my job. Yeah, I call me one. because there's a workbook coming out this summer that's gonna be useful for you. So I think it's coming out by Workman that is awesome. So oh, we'll awesome. connect later on that. Folks, it has been a wonderful evening of great dialogue, of wonderful art that you've shared with all of us. And I have to say, I'm going to have to minimize each of you to give my exit for the evening, but it's been absolutely a wonderful time. And I think everyone will admit, will agree that it has been a very special evening. I want to thank you to Sequoia, Carla, and Lance for participating in Write America this evening. To everyone who tuned in tonight, and in particular thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series to look forward to each and every Monday evening. 
We hope to see you this Wednesday. That's day after tomorrow, the 5th, for a very special episode of Right America as Roger Rosenblatt welcomes former Vice President Al Gore to the screen at 7 p.m. Please join us. And remember that Bird's Books carries books that you certainly can purchase. Happy New Year, and thank you again for the evening. <laughs>